Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with an unashamed, nostalgic reminiscence. I want to talk a little. I'm going to do a few of these videos because I just have such memories of LPs that I bought most frequently. Now, I'm sure I was not the only collector who, when you found a record that you just really loved and played endlessly, that you thought, oh gosh, I'd better get some extra copies because they were going to wear out. They did. They wore out. I know if you had ridiculously high-end equipment, um, you could somehow postpone the wearing outedness by having lighter tracking and, and special styli and whatnot. But you know, I didn't have that. I wasn't rich. I was a high school kid. I had a decent system. I mean, that was like my, my life's ambition. I mean, I worked, I slaved, I saved up money, I asked for gifts, I got presents, I got, you know, I worked an entire summer in a meat packing plant in New Jersey so I could spend the money on a stereo and a good turntable. And my uncle bought it for me and paid me anyway. He was the best. And, you know, I, so I, I was I was careful. I also had, remember that, that stuff, the anti-static spray crap that you put on your records and wiped with a cloth and all that. Oh, yes, I did everything I could, but it didn't matter because the stuff that I played as frequently as I played it was going to die. It was going to die the death of a thousand plays. And it also depended on you know, who made the record, the quality of the actual pressing. But the discs I had the most problems with. Well, what can I say? Anything American, any crappy American pressing there. There was Dino Warp and there was, there was, you know, Decca's London division that ruined all of the American recordings and, and, and also Angel, EMI's thing, which did stuff that had like widely spaced grooves that were like dust magnets. It was weird, just weird. But the worst offender in my view um, from my point of view, the most difficulty I had was with Deutsche Grammophon. Because Deutsche Grammophon, I mean, Deutsche Grammophon was quality stuff. These were quality pressings. They showed up at a, you know, they had shiny, shiny albums, laminated shininess. And the the LPs were in a, a, a plastic inner sleeve, you know, with paper on, on the outside and plastic on the inside to protect them. But there was something about DG's formula I don't know what that attracted static electricity and the static electricity acted, you know, attracted dust. I mean, Phillips, for example, you know, they slid it nicely out of the, out of the sleeve. No problems with no problems at all. They played beautifully and they stayed that way. And the same thing was even true of like, you know, London records and, and, and Columbia for heaven's sake, you know, but Deutsche Grammophon. You know, you could turn the thing upside down and shake it. That that record was 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 somehow statically stuck in there. And then when you took it out, you know, you held it with one corner and you got your hand in there and you got your 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 middle finger around the 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 hole in the middle and you sort of slid the thing out or you pulled it out by the edge. You know, and it went like this. And then if you looked around, you could see this dust war pool forming in the atmosphere above the record as all the dust went and stuck right to the, right to the record. Oh my God, it was horrible. And then you couldn't get it off. And, and, and within one or two plays, you had unbearable crackling. I'm just wondering if anyone else had the same experience because they were really quality things compared to the American crap. And I thought, well, you know, and you were paying top dollar and it was really going to be great. But no, no, there was dust everywhere. It was impossible. You had to be in a clean room to play those records. So the record that I probably bought the most often, more than any other, and I must have purchased dozens of them, quite literally, was this one. Well, this is a CD, of course, and this is not even, you know, the original CD. This is just one I have sitting around because um, it was reissued a million times. It was Kubelik doing Janicek's Sinfonietta and Taras Bulba. I mean, this record totally blew my mind. I first got it when I was in college because I had no idea who Janicek was. It was in, it was in 1979. I was still in the freshman dorms at Johns Hopkins University, and I was at Record Masters at the Rotunda. Some of you have mentioned that you knew where that was, um, you Baltimoreans. And, and they had a, 
a separate classical annex, actually, at one point. Originally, they didn't, but then they separated and went across the hall. And, yeah. and, and they organized things by, by label, by label and catalog number, which was just such a wonderful way to do it because you, you just thumb through to see what was available. And there was a bin of, of DG LPs. They had the LPs in bins and the operas and shelves on the wall. And I'm going through here and I see this, this cover it was the cover. It was a weird, funky looking cover. And I had no idea who Janicek was. I had no idea what a Taurus Bulba was. I'd never seen the movie at that point with Yul Brynner and Tony Curtis, um, or the wonderful score of that by Franz Waxman, which is amazing. I, I, it was a Taurus Bulba and a Sinfonietta. And it just looked really weird. I mean, it was like some red, you know, expressionist thing on the cover. So I had no idea what it was. I took a look at it and I asked the guys who were very knowledgeable, what is this? And they said, oh, it's really cool. Janicek's amazing. Um, and he wrote great operas. And I was not up to opera in Czech until like about 10 minutes later after I heard the Sinfonietta and Taras Balba. Then all of a sudden I became a great fan of Czech opera. But but I was I, I went home and I bought it and it was just, oh my God, the opening fanfare of that Sinfonietta. You know, it's got 14 trumpets, that piece. The opening is only for 12 or so, but oh my God, it's incredible. It was incredible. And Tars Bulba was gorgeous and romantic and had bells and an organ. And I mean, you know, harps going crazy. I, there was nothing not to love. Absolutely nothing not to love. But of course, the second time I played it, it was going. So I got out my anti-static thing and my soft cloth and I wiped it off and I tried it again and it was okay for one more play. That It was hopeless. Absolutely hopeless trying to keep that damn record clean. So I got a couple more, which I kept wrapped at all times, waiting for the moment when I would have to make the switch. And then even after college, you know, I was I was back in, in, in Connecticut briefly um, before I went out to graduate school at Stanford University. And I got some more of them when I was in New Haven at Cutler's, which was, you know, in New Haven next to Yale University, next to the Yale Co-op on York Street, which was a fabulous store and it's gone now too. It's just so, so sad. We had so much fun there. And there was a there was a guy there who was his name was Sam. And Sam was also extremely knowledgeable. He smoked un, he smoked unfiltered cigarettes. He always had nicotine stains in his fingers, a little brushy mustache. He was like, you know, five feet tall. And and he, he used to counsel me. Um, so I got some more Taras Pulvas there. And I, I couldn't have enough of them. So I, finally, I was so relieved when CDs came out and that thing finally showed up because I knew I could get one and I wouldn't have to worry about it. Then, of course, it was issued on CD in 500 different formats, including this one, which was the, the Classic Con German Import DG Mid-Price Series or something like that. But it came out in regular DG and also with couplings because the two works are pretty short. It only was about a 45 minute long disc, all told, or LP. So they added some of Firkuzny's Yadachev piano music with Kubelik on this one, and you know, you saw others. But Deutsche Grammophon was a problem. And that was the record that I resolved never to do without. And so I had it, always, lots of it. Did you do that? I'm wondering, how, how many, what was your record of, of, of choice where you needed to have multiple spares <laughs> available at all times? I'm just curious. I just think it was you know, one of those things that collectors had to do back in the day. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me and do tell me. Take care.